Hello and welcome back. Today I want to look at one of the newest free circuit simulators out there, QSpice. Some say it's quite a competitor to LTSpice. And on a deeper look, although it has some really interesting and useful features, it's not perfect either. But if you're curious about that and much more, then keep watching. So, first things first, what is this and where do you get it from? Well, QSpice is a free for commercial use, Spice language circuit simulator, and you can get it from the Corvo website. And as long as your computer respects the minimum system requirements, so there's certain space related things and well, you need a Windows 11 or 64 bit Windows 10 machine, then you shouldn't have any problems. So at the moment at least, there seems to be no mention of Apple or Linux support. Now, other things worth mentioning is that one of the people behind this program is Mr. Mike Engelhardt, who may sound familiar since he is one of the main creators behind LT Spice. So this software came from very good hands. And well, if you want to get an idea of what sort of things you can do with this software, there's already a set of short videos detailing the main features and the operation. So if you're really interested in this program, I highly recommend looking at these. So anyway, once you get QSpice now and uh, install it, then you are greeted with a quick starting tip, which never really changes. So these two are the only tips that you get. They're enough. Anyway, this is the main schematic drawing interface. You have some basic menus. If you want to listen to one of the Initial tips, you have this demos folder, which is already accessible from the file menu. In the edit menu, among other things, you have a few set of limited settings. So you have some preferences that you can change and you can also change the color of certain things. And well, the final important thing here is the help file. So this will be quite important and handy as we will see later. Next, here on the left side, you have your component browser. So Starting with the native basic devices, you have your diodes, let's just place one. You have capacitors, voltage sources, and all sorts of things. Then moving lower, we have this behavioral set. So here we have a set of more complex blocks. So get various amplifier thingies. You have various logic gates, other logic gates, and well, miscellaneous things like a clock sync something, so you might need this of course. And finally, you have some Corvo products, like various high voltage transistors, JFET and silicon carbide, and various high voltage silicon carbide diodes. And as you have already noticed, here on the bottom, we have a nice preview window, where you can see the components symbol. Now, for the components that you've already placed, if you double click it, you get this extra menu appearing with the various attributes and settings of the component. And well, to better see this program, we can start drawing in a basic circuit. Let's say our diode is driven by our voltage source. We will be using various key shortcuts. So for example, W inserts a wire, pressing G will bring up a ground symbol. If we don't like the circuit, we can move things around. So by clicking and holding, or we can move the entire thing. If we hold the shift key, then we can select everything and well, move it or well, parts of things. Finally, we need to give some values to the component. For the diode, we have a selection guide. So here we have a set of components from which we can choose. And for the voltage source, well, we need to edit its attribute. So let's say we want a two volt supply. Now, finally to run the circuit, we right click, click run simulation. Here we can see some of the shortcuts. We get an error saying that there is no analysis command found. And they give us a nice example, dot tran space 5m. So to insert such a spice directive, again, we need to right click, place a spice directive somewhere, and we can edit it with the recommended values. So now when we run the simulation, a new window appears 
which contains the waveforms from the simulation. So we can plot out the voltage, or we need to adjust things. By clicking on a net, we can plot out the voltage, and by clicking on a component, we will plot out the current. Now, to make things a bit more interesting, let's just change this circuit into a pulse. So taking the pulse voltage source from the menu, and we can start editing the various attributes. So we want to go from one to two volts, with rise time of 5 milliseconds, and well, when we rerun, we now get a more interesting result. Here, by double clicking on one of the plotted values, we get our cursors that we can move around, and well, in this window again, we have a basic set of extra menus, so we can set a few preferences, the colors. If we want to analyze these waveforms in more detail, we have the option of right clicking and performing an FFT analysis on the waveform, so with these that's not really interesting. And if we right click on the plotted values, then we get a nice window appearing where we can create more complex expressions. So we have here the set of mathematical functions that work in QSpice. And if we hold Ctrl and right click on one of these values, then we have a set of measurements that can be inserted. So for example, if I want to figure out the maximum value, a calculation is created that tells me what is the maximum value of the plotted quantity and when do we get it. So it's 2 volts at 5 milliseconds. So in a very basic nutshell, this is how you use the program. So what are my personal first thoughts on all of this? Well, it does look more modern than LTSpice. This two separate window approach is very nice if you have two separate monitors. So I feel like this is more geared towards a professional use case rather than your average amateur. Also, other than your basic building blocks, you have a ton of new ones, which can be quite handy in complex circuits. But the exact way in which you edit some of the components will make this tool best suited for the experienced user. So for example, our simulation command, if you never use a spy simulator, it will be very difficult to understand what the various values mean and what sort of things you can actually do with the simulator. So when you start editing this thing, you get this small hint window appearing, but once all of the values are filled in, so let's just put in some values, if we try to re-edit, well, all of the hints have disappeared. The computer is just giving us a thumbs up, so everything is perfect. So if you want to do any later editing, that will require knowledge of what the various numbers actually mean or you will have to open up the help file to see the exact definitions of the various numbers. In a similar fashion, with the voltage source, you can start filling out the various values, and then the parameters again become very cryptic. So anyway, to give this program a fair try, I started working on a basic transistor amplifier circuit. You can easily attribute net labels to highlight them, so to interconnect various nets. I also added in a dot step statement, so to vary the frequency of my injected signal, and while well, on the output result, I created an FFT, which can be saved back into the schematic as a picture. So one of the interesting things with this program is that you can paste various pictures or various measurements directly into the circuit schematic to be able to view them at a later point. So for example, if I right click, we have this copy bitmap to clipboard option, and if I now press Ctrl V, so paste, we get this nice picture appearing, which is the, well, schematic that I've showed you a minute ago. So you can extract the various pictures or measurements from the program or from an external source. So the second picture was edited, as you can see, by drawing all over it. Now to continue the experiment further, I made a copy of the initial circuit, and rather than using the built-in transistor model, I used a manufacturer sub-circuit model, so this is the SPICE model for the BFU520 transistor, which you can add into the circuit as a SPICE directive, and well, you can change your transistor to be of X type, so a sub-circuit, the initial transistor was of QN type, which is bipolar transistor, and well, after changing the symbol type, I changed the component name, and now the circuit is simulating with the new SPICE model. If we run the circuit, and we zoom in a bit, well, we can see the various waveforms that we've simulated. 
Now, if we move to an AC type of simulation, so this is a small signal simulation, we can do this by adding in the AC statement. Again, we get no indication of what the various values mean. So after they were edited, we just get our thumbs up. So you will need to know how to fill it in and well, to know that the AC type of simulation actually exists. And well, for the simulation to run correctly, you also need to know that you have to define one of your signal sources as AC space one. So this will be the injected signal. So if we run this simulation, again, a new window appears. As you can see, there's all sorts of windows here all separate. We can now see our result. So this is the result for the circuit with the BFU transistor. And while the other one, well, there's a bit of a difference in the bandwidth. So the first circuit starts losing its gain at around 13 megahertz, whereas the other circuit has plenty of gain even beyond 70. Now, sadly, one of the features you have in LDSpice that is not working here is the .NET statement, which is a network analysis statement. So this can be used in LDSpice to extract things like port impedance or S parameters, and well, here it does nothing. It doesn't even give us a error or anything. So let's look at some other things now. One of the key highlights behind this program is its hierarchical design possibility. And one good way to show this is using the practical SMPS demo circuit. So using subcircuit blocks is nothing special. You have complex blocks built from multiple base components, all drawn up into a nice rectangle. But usually the circuit behind this rectangle is a netlist. So a list of all the components, their interconnecting nets, and well, their description parameters. This is how you usually find component models, and this is what you usually import when you want to use a subcircuit. But the special thing in QSPICE is that behind the circuit block, other than the netlist, you can also have an actual circuit. So if we double click this example, we get a new window appearing with the internal schematic. So it's not just a netlist, but a clearly drawn out schematic with multiple complex blocks. This makes component modeling far more easy on the eye. And at the same time, if you want to simulate a large schematic with multiple blocks, again, this will make organizing and visualizing everything far easier. So you can have multiple subcircuits in one schematic, and then each of those subcircuits have a distinct description schematic. Now, the next special thing in QSPICE is that the subcircuit itself does not have to be a netlist, or well, a schematic with interconnected components. But rather, it can be a C++ or Verilog program. So if we continue looking at this particular example, we have a second hierarchical block contained in the first one, which if we select is of DLL type, and we can open it by right clicking and viewing it in either the C++ interface or in the Verilog interface. So I'll open the C++ source code, which opens another window. And here we have the complete program behind our subcircuit block. Now, when you're creating such a subcircuit, normally you right click and create a template, which fills in the initial statements, the initial definitions, and then you can start writing in your own code. So for certain applications, it will be far easier to describe a component's behavior in code rather than with electronic components. And as the creators of QSpice pointed out, this sort of code implementation will be far faster in execution than the execution of an equivalent circuit that has the same behavior. So QSpice is quite a good program considering it's free. It has a lot of features which make it an interesting prospect if you're willing to put in the time to learn all of its quirks. However, because certain things are not obvious and it requires some previous knowledge about spy simulators in general, I feel like it will be far more useful to the professional user rather than to the average hobbyist. For that, LTSpice is still better. But in the end, the best tool is not the newest or the prettiest or even the fastest, it's the one that you know how to properly use. And for me personally, when it comes to circuit simulation, that is LTSpice. So in the future, I will be mainly sticking to that. And with that said, hope you got some useful information out of this, leave your thoughts in the comments, thank you for watching. Make sure to subscribe to be updated on videos and see you next time. Bye bye.